Welcome back to Talk Gnosis, and it's a real welcome back. We're welcoming back at Michael Osborne. We're, this is a part two, where we're going to be discussing his book, The Alchemy of William Blake, The Free Principles of the Divine Essence and an Allegory of the Spiritual Condition of Man. Just rolls right off the tongue. But the shorter title, The Alchemy of William Blake. I praised it highly at the beginning of the first show. Uh, it, if you haven't heard that show yet, you should actually listen to it. Uh, it's going to give you a foundation for this part two. And also buy the book and read it, and that'll give you a better foundation. So, Michael, well, with that said, I was thinking we've got a lot of ground to cover. We're going to be talking about Jacob Boema, the Yakka Firma, however people say his name, whose thought is notoriously complex. And one of the things I love about your book is that it's a great introduction to this thought. It breaks it down. It connects it to lots of, you know, because you're exploring this piece of art, because you're exploring the influence on Blake, there's a coat hanger to hang the coat on of these complicated ideas. So, again, that's why I highly recommend the book. But I, I think we got to start with who was Jacob? Who was Jacob Boema? Okay, um, Jacob Boema um, was a, a Lutheran German theorist and a mystic. He was born in 1575 to a family of small holders in Gorlitz, Silesia. Gorlitz is now divided between what is now Germany and modern Poland, following the Odenisa division at the end of the Second World War. So his actual home in Gorlitz is now on the Polish side of the border. He wasn't formally educated. He got married in 1594, and it was in 1612, around that sort of time, that he had his first mystical experience. And that sort of set him on the path, really, of, and it may have been a bit earlier than that, but that set him on the path, really, of writing down his thoughts, which he describes really almost as, a, in the sense of automatic spirit writing. And in fact, at one point in his confessions, he says he's taken over by the spirit, essentially, to, to compose his work. So these ideas and thoughts stream through his mind. He was taken on by a couple of mentors, both with alchemical backgrounds, and they brought him up to speed, essentially. They, if you like, perfected the rough ashlar that was this German Silesian farmer that had become a cobbler, was apprenticed to a cobbler. And they gave him a rudimentary education. And therefore, he was to use the knowledge and the terminology that they gave him to make sense of his visions and of his interpretation of things and what really motivated him was explaining the existence of of evil and its presence in the world and how we could essentially reintegrate back into god in order to, to escape it and escape materiality so he was in the grand scheme of uh, the grand tradition i should say of mystics that, that, that have always written really particularly within the theme of christian mysticism let's call it that way so, he, like I said, he was a Lutheran from that background, but he did get into trouble occasionally with the Lutheran church, primarily, as always, because he sticks his head over the parapet, gets published, gets noticed, and develops a small following, and that then becomes a threat, really, to the exoteric church. Otherwise, they, they'd have left him alone, I think. Yeah. So your book draws uh, significant connections between William Blake and the thought of Burma. What first sparked your interest in exploring his influence on Blake? The genesis of it, really, is essentially the other way round. It was an interest in Burma, which connected later on with Blake. So I think if you're approaching it as a sort of Blake scholar, which I'm not, you probably wouldn't notice a lot of the the metaphor, really, an allegory um, in Blake's work, this particular work anyway, that points to these influences on his thinking and on his cosmogony and his theology. Uh, Bo Boma isn't the only one, but Boma is the one that influences the others too. So he's a common theme. And we know Blake read and owned Boehmer's works. He mentions it in his letters. And we also know, for instance, that, that he, he, he read and knew a little bit about Swedenborg, but he wasn't as influenced by Swedenborg for as long. And I think where Blakeian scholars often go, go wrong is that they tend to emphasise the influence of Swedenborg on, on Blake, and that's true. But what they forget is that there's an antecedent 
um, influence prior to Swedenborg, and that is Boehmer. Okay? And Boehmer himself doesn't write in a vacuum either. He's had his mentors, he's had his masters that have given him the academic and intellectual tools, if you like, with which to write. So his, his writings are often considered uh, very complex, difficult to understand. How did you approach interpreting and explaining his work in the book? I think all art really has the effect of being able to reach out to our subconscious in the way that sometimes words cannot do. The same may be said of music as well. There's something in it which, in its wordlessness, which can create a sense of spirituality, a sort of like a connection, if you like, with that aspect of us. Blake is a very good example of someone who can draw around spiritual um, themes. He also brings in a lot of politics and um, social justice, of course, and, and they are motivating factors for him. But he does it in a way which makes you question and query these things. And I mentioned this last time we spoke. Um, I had tickets bought for me for the uh, Blake exhibition at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. Armed as I am now from a Martinist background with a certain knowledge and experience in identifying Sweden, Borgian influences, for instance, of Martinist ones and so on, discovering this particular painting suddenly was a eureka moment for me because I saw in it, hang on, I've got the three principles of Boema going on in this. I have the contrast of dark and light. I have these themas which are very very much connected with Boehmer. So that's the provenance, and that's how it came about. Yeah. So in the last show, you gave us a cliffhanger. You mentioned that God isn't a trinity, but is fourfold, a, a, a quaternary. Uh, yeah. What does this mean? Boehmer is quite clear that he doesn't wish to be restricted by the words he's using, and that he's using his books essentially to try and convey in human language something that is ineffable and indescribable. Okay, so we've got to start with that. So he, what he says is, given that I'm going to draw on alchemy and I'm going to draw on numerology and I'm going to draw on theology and other things to try and explain to you what I'm seeing and what my perception of the, what I'm being taught by these other extra-dimensional beings of Nemo coming into contact and through his um, clairvoyance. For instance, it's seeing physical things like light in a spiritual way as well. So the core of his theology essentially um, centres around the three principles from which Swedenborg drew, drew his heavenly doctrine to the three worlds, for instance, which is that there's a, a celestial world, there's an angelic realm, and there's the, this material realm. And what he's interested in doing is to discussing how they came about. And to do that, he says, um, each has passed through almost like a, a, a birth, but simultaneously, not in a sort of linear way, through a process, through a stage of these three principles. So the first would be the primal nature of God, what God is made of, what he's composed of, the forces that are there before, if you like, even consciousness is taken into account. But again, he's careful to say that this is only human terminology. We, we can never really properly convey it. Secondly, would be the manifestation of spirit. So you could say that's the second principle. And it is that, that don't forget, there's simultaneous emanation so you have wrath and you have volatility and and things of that nature in this first principle okay but what it does is give birth or generate automatically this consciousness this and he likens that to spirit and it's this which then introduces love which mollifies and contains the wrath it's like the positive and the negative, which are very important themes to Boehmer. You can't have good without 
evil, for instance, because you need both of them as creative principles in the same way that there's male and female, positive and negative, and so on and so forth. And then, beyond this, then, is the manifestation, if you like, of, of sentient life independent of God, although it comes essentially from his substance, from the same material. And again, Swedenborg borrows from this as well, okay? Um, and that would then be, if you like, the minor spirits, the humans and the angels and things of this nature, okay? And you end up with, obviously, the material generations in a sense it's like the thought will and action of god and then you have an outcome which is a fourth part now boema writes in terms of god the father son and holy spirit so it's trinitarian that's the core the core basis and he, he likens those to the principles as well but you've got a fourth and that's the manifestation of wisdom okay at one point in his writing, he also equates this with the Virgin Mary, for instance, Theotokos, the God-bearer, but wisdom certainly. And it is she in his cosmology who is the, the breath of life, the giver of life to the creative world, which comes through these various principles and ultimately ends up as man. And then, you, of course, you have the fall in the traditional sense where this substance, if you like, hardens and materializes into our present world now that's an entirely rubbish explanation of boema but it, it's a sort of very brief potted outline of it essentially no i think that's great and, and it's very clear yeah. and again people hopefully this will excite them if they're if they don't know anything about Burma, they'll uh, jump into his work with this great introduction you did touch on evil the question of evil the nature of evil can you talk about that more in his thought like how the relationship between evil and god is different from mainstream christian theology of the time uh, and yeah. clarify is there evil contained within god yeah this is where i hope to sort of open up a common dialogue really but um for boema good and evil have to coexist and that's the key concept you have to understand so for him, human beings have the capacity for both good and evil, as do other, if you like, um, disembodied intelligences as well as part of the creation. Okay. It necessitates a sort of urgency in, from his part of obtaining self-knowledge before it's too late. So this life is very much given to try and understand yourself and your part in that and the choices you have and to opt for good or for virtue. Okay, there's, here's, a, there's a quote I'd like to read to you, if I may, from Boehmer. He says, seeing therefore that we are in such horrible danger in this world, that we are environed with enemies on every side, and have a very unsafe pilgrimage or journey to war, and above all, our evil and corrupt nature and will, which is inclined to all evil, you can see how the Martinist stream is influenced by the thinking, okay, yeah. that the human mind or consciousness is essentially almost like an open sponge to the influences of evil coming in. But it's equally opens the influences of good. And the key is choice. It's the decision to choose and then to draw upon the protection of good, if you like. But it's only a microcosm of what's going on in the Godhead itself, and that's the amazing thing, actually, about it all. So I suppose in his way of looking at it, everything will work out, but you've got this allotted time of which to figure out what your choice is and place in, in all of this is. So the issue of evil is central to his thinking. So the the difference between Boehmer and earlier philosophers, I suppose, Aquinas and so on and so forth, is that he uses alchemical um, analogies in order to explain, uh, if you like, the sort of, within the context of his time, the sort of the scientific premise behind the existence of evil and good. That's essentially what he's doing. So again, if I may, he says, everything is so at odds with itself in this world as we see it uh, be not only in the living creatures, but also in the stars, the elements, earth, the stones, metals, in wood, leaves, and even grass, there is a poison and mal malignity 
um, in all things, and it is found that it must be, or else there would be no life, no mobility, nor would there be any colour nor virtue, neither thickness nor thinness, nor any perceptibility or sensibility, but all would be as nothing. Yeah, it's fascinating for a lot of the things that I'm thinking about right now, because he's such an influence on Hegel later on, who also talks about this sort of dialectical nature of the universe, where A never completely equals A. There's always something that works against itself, a contradiction that's at the heart of everything in our universe. And yeah. he, he Hegel's obviously getting it from his reading of Burma, and it's all contained within that quote that you gave us. Yeah, my, my particular reading of ancient Gnosticism, usually when I say Gnosticism, I almost always mean the secret book of John. <laughs> so that's like my go-to text. And I know that the phrase Gnosticism is not always helpful, but I, I do actually mm -hmm. see something similar in the secret book of John, that it has a similar message about this contradictory existence, this, this mixture of the light and the dark, which is necessary in some mysterious way for God to know itself. Right. Uh, well, when do they think that was written? They think of the second century, or at least a version in the second century, because we have quotes from it in, in, Irenae in Irenaeus, but the version that we have seems to be much more developed, and it's from the, the fourth century, but so goes through later edits, perhaps gets more sophisticated. Second to fourth century. And it's essentially dualistic, is it? Yes, it, it is dualistic, but I think that dualism is overly overly focused on it. It's not quite dualistic. It's, it is, at the end of the day, a monistic track because it opens up talking about the monad, and it says that everything is contained within the monad, even though the, the monad is not a being, it's not a god, but it's also not a being and not a god, right? So it well, does open up. Simple then. Yes, exactly. Hmm. There's a lot of similar thought, and I think there are some continuities uh, between ancient esotericism the ancient Gnostics, other forms of mystical Christianity, and what we find in medieval times, what we find even now. But that said, those continuities are not always that powerful or strong. But if there is any kind of reality to this stuff, people are going to have mystical experiences and then phrase them into similar ways. Because again, yeah, all of this and all of these elaborate systems, the Secret Book of John, of course, has a very complex unfolding of the aeons. It's similar to the, the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. We can spend all our time on these very precise diagrams, and they can be helpful. But you, we're still trying to, uh, we're still ants trying to understand a rocket ship, right? So it's it is the, the language can only uh, go so far at the end of the day, even though uh, sometimes uh, mystical and esoteric uh, occult language can go quite precise when we whip out these maps and whip out these concepts. Do you find the ineffability, the unknowability of these things, quite comforting? Yeah, I do, actually, at the end of the day. And I hope other people do, too. I, I have to repeat myself on the show. That's fine. It's, it's everybody's first episode. But I, I also think that there's a, a deep irony. And maybe the ancient Gnostics meant this irony. I don't think so. I'm reading it into, into it, which is to be a Gnostic, which can be a small g Gnostic, right? A knower is to, is to not know and to figure out that at the end of the day, you're not going to know. It's to give up the knowing, to give up the wanting of knowing and knowing how to do that and knowing when to do that. You, we find that in the, the Cloud of Unknowing, the famous the contemplative text from early medieval Europe, where it's to truly know God, you actually have to give up everything that you think that ends. Let's turn off the knowing fact, please, for a couple of minutes. Yeah, so, Joy Davidman that said, wrote that C.S. Lewis's wife, that belief in God in its simplest form is an act of surrender. Yes. Yeah, and it goes into that, those ideas about faith, relationship, you know, even grace. But I, to clearly answer your initial question, do I find it comforting? Yeah, I do. And, and I think I, I, as I've aged in, in my 20s or early 30s, I, I wouldn't have found it comforting. But I think that there's actually something very exciting about this mystery. And as I said, it, it is, we're talking about God trying to know itself. And I wonder in the mystical experiences that we have and the mythologies that we have, there is an end point, which is all, also the beginning, right? The reintegration, which probably happens outside of time uh, as we know it. So what are we even talking about? Everything is contained within the monad. But that said, it, 
I, I wonder if this journey of knowing actually never does end. Maybe there is some sort of existence even after reconciliation, reintegration, maybe the adventure continues. Maybe the knowing, absolute knowing is, is never fully reached and that's okay and that's good. It, it can go on well, forever. I, you know. Well, wrote that it starts all over again. Yeah. But I mean, what sort of time you're talking about might work. Yeah. But who knows? It's a bit like a, a galaxy far away a long time ago, isn't it, really? It's so, <laughs> think to that, yeah. yeah. It's all true. Yeah. Um, but of course, obviously, this idea of regeneration lies at the heart of it. And what is it? The alchemists, the spiritual alchemists, they thought that they could somehow regenerate in this life. Essentially, it's not often spoken of, but they're trying to resurrect themselves through processes, through, because the substances that we have are grosser versions of, of what's going on elsewhere on a more subtle level. Now, I, that, that's probably why I, I, I don't think anyone would have reached the end to that process. Yeah, you know, I just don't, other than Christ, of course, who we know from his resurrection body, it gives us an example. But then again, we don't know, forgive me, but that all could be an allegory written by people saying, look, this is how it will be. And it doesn't really matter in that sense. The thing about Boehmer, though, is that he wants to try and explain the origins of God, doesn't he? He goes back to the very, very beginning, and of course it's impossible to do it, but he gives it a good stab. Um, and I wonder what the, the motivation was. I, I, I don't know, really. There was something in him that, that desired to write um, in that way. Yeah, exactly. I'll bring it uh, the, back to, to the question sheet. We, we were talking about evil, and this sort of ties into it. But the concept of the quote-unquote dark world, capital D, capital well, W, and how does this relate to his understanding of creation and human existence? He speaks in, in metaphors and in allegories. It's not necessarily dark or light as we perceive it. But I've mentioned that you have these opposites. You have evil and good, and you have active and passive. And we see these in alchemy. We see it in astrology. We see it in all of the esoteric tradition as above, so below it goes off. Okay? Um, so... You have to have both. We exist in both. We stand in front of the rainbow. We are not behind it, but we can see the promise of what lies behind. And essentially what he's driving at with all these things is that there has to be a balance and a, a reconciliation, not a reconciliation. It's not that light ever consumes the darkness or vice versa. It's simply that they do coexist and that light somehow contains the dark. Okay, so it's how the spirit realm may influence the unconscious aspect, if you like, uh, of the monad. Okay, now in Blake's painting, the monad is this big disc that we see at the very top, and then you have the three figures below. And we have these three figures below. So we have a trinity below and the fourth above. And then either side, you've got the left and right paths or ladders, a descending ladder of dark and an ascending ladder of light. The Old Testament down to the crucifixion is the dark side and the light side begins at the resurrection and up to the light. And there's a metaphor then for the dark and the light. You have it, but it's all in one picture. It's all part of this generative process. And without one, you can't have the other. It's a bit like the Force in Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. With Can you talk to us about his ideas about, which you did mention in passing, you mentioned uh, wisdom even being the fourth, wisdom being associated with Mary the mother, but can you tell us more about his ideas of the feminine aspect of divinity, particularly his concept of Sophia or divine wisdom? Okay. Wisdom, if you like, is the outcome, the quaternary aspect. So if you have thought, will, and action, there's a result, there's an outcome, which is part of the divine process of separation and reintegration. And it's allegorized here in the painting. You can see what some people believe 
faith, hope, and charity, or the three theological virtues at the bottom. And in the center is charity, in fact, wisdom, and this great light about her, and out of which rises this figure. It's actually three figures. We've got a central figure with a light above her head, and then we have two parts separating way. And she represents, the three of them represents the three parts of man. And they're being generated forth from wisdom. So wisdom is a, a personified aspect of the creative process, like a mother, really. And just as Mary gives birth to Christ, the man God, the divine man, so too is wisdom, if you like, giving birth to all of us in the same way. Okay? So she's part, she emanates from the second principle and takes um, a leading role in what goes on in the third in the emanation of physical life, as we see here. And you have this ascending soul and you have other souls coming out of this matrix, if you like, of life in the second principle below. You have the third principle in the middle and then you have the Trinity above and the divine monad above that, so the quaternary aspects of God. So wisdom is that all of these figures, with the exception perhaps possibly of the one in the top right, are female. The one in the top right is androgynous and wisdom is the key figure in this particular work of art. You can see her there at the bottom, but she is very still. And so this idea of, if you like, conscious life of choice and of, of separation is what belongs to the human spirit in the center. Okay. So it's all part of the same thing, but she is a separate creative part of that process, if you like, the outcome. But it's all allegorized and it is in Boehmer's writing. And it is also in Blake's work. Can you tell us more about what you personally see as the most significant contributions of Burma's thought to Western esoteric thought, to Christian mystical thought, what have you? I think the idea that consciousness ultimately derives from God, essentially because a substance and form is ultimately derived from God. And it operates under different laws because that's the way of our world of entropy. Uh, stuck in time but this idea that um th there's a sort of like an actus within us that is um somehow connected um with with god and and provides us with consciousness i think is a key theme of Boehmer's work which finds its way into von Bader and eckhart Hausen, for instance and swedenborg and so on and blake is if you like he's also attracted to those like that idea and for him he would refer to, to such thing as the imagination that's the divine the, the divine consciousness if you like within us and because we are of the same stuff we are also the divine body and as such part of christ and in a way the church the exoteric church embraces that not in those so much words but through, for instance, the sacrament of the Eucharist, where we digest, of course, the body and blood of, of Christ and become as one with him. And those are the words that are used in the Eucharist. I don't know if anything similar happens in the in the masses that you celebrate, Jonathan, do they? But yes, uh, we use the, the words of institution, but they are there. Like many Gnostic churches, although we have a few different liturgies that, that we celebrate, a few different forms of the liturgy, a lot of times the predominant liturgy of both us and, and others would resemble a high church liturgy, right? That a high church Oxfordian Anglican would be comfortable at, or Catholicism, if yeah. you don't have a priest playing guitar, if you have a more traditional mass. Okay, on that point, because it's a, it's a relevant, does, you're a Johannite church, correct? Yep. Yep. What's your view on um, transubstantiation, for instance? Yeah, the, uh, the we're a little dogma church, but, but we actually do say uh, the, the we do believe in transubstantiation. Uh, that said, uh, the sort of the statement is just that uh, we believe that it happens, uh, but we don't uh, tell people to uh, 
how they should understand the mystery of transubstantiation. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, because it's the exoteric church essentially saying exactly what the mystics are, are, have been saying. Yeah. And all of these things, all of them, all, always play into our, if you like, um, collective unconscious, don't they? The, the archetypes that are there. And Now, what are those? For Burma, it's the light within, and it's that, our light within, which connects with the light that is out and about. And I think that's a very core thing. And, and for me, things like communion are, if you like, a connection with that, physically con a connection with that. Yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. And I was interested to hear that, that you have that. Yeah. Yeah. I guess to, to finish up, uh, so we talked about some of the main ideas that you liked, but you did mention some figures in passing. But how did Averma's work uh, influence later thinkers and mystics besides William Blake? Through the likes of Blake and, and Swedenborg and Rudolf Steiner later and theosophists and so on, it has had a big impact, certainly on the esoteric, Christian esoteric tradition. The, these guys, particularly Bomar, he was writing from experience. It's what I talked about in our last meeting where I was talking about how Blake actually had visions of these things and the rest of us rely on other people to tell us and we choose as an act of faith whether to accept or believe them and that's my experience yes i've had the occasional if you like supernatural experience but not very often but i think they're quite rare and i think they're rare for most people yeah. as cardinal newman said if you went through life on a con constantly in that state you wouldn't be able to function and that's not what your physical senses are designed for. They're there to screen things out. But with these guys, with Blake and Boehmer and so forth, and Swedenborg, or the Abbe Forney in, in the Martinist tradition, you have men who actually perceive these spirit realms, these spiritual existences. So he says, My spirit broke through the doors of hell. The very strong words and penetrated even unto the innermost essence of its newly born divinity where it was received with great love as a bridegroom welcomes his beloved bride no word can express the great joy and triumph i experienced as of a life out of death as of a resurrection from the dead while in this state as I was walking through a field of flowers, I saw through the mystery of creation, the original of this world and of all creatures. Then for seven days, I was in a continual state of ecstasy, surrounded by the light of the spirit, which immersed me in contemplation and happiness. I learned what God is and what is his will. I knew not how this happened to me, but my heart admired and praised the Lord for it. Perfect. I, I think that's a perfect place to, to end. And I want people to go out and buy The Alchemy of William Blake, The Three Principles of the Divine Essence and an Allegory of the Spiritual Condition of Man, RoadCircleBooks.com. Also Amazon as well. And so you can help us to keep the show going by going to Patreon.com slash Gnostic. You can do micro donations here every month. You can do one-time donations at paypal.me. Michael, thanks again so much for coming on, and we'll see you next book. Take care. Thanks.